Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Fabian, for the introduction and the kind words. Um, I also would like to thank you, everyone, for being here today. I'm excited to share some of the findings of my master's degree project with all of you. Well, to get started, uh, the title of my thesis is Mitigation of Nitrate, Nitrous Oxide, uh, and Ammonia Loss with Time and Source of Nitrogen Application in Corn. To start my presentation today, uh, I want to talk about the nitrogen cycle. Uh, in the center of this picture here, uh, you can see some corn plants. Corn plants need large amounts of nitrogen to produce great yields. And one of the most common nitrogen fertilizer sources used in agriculture in the Midwest and in the world is urea. And a few reasons for that are the high content of available nitrogen and the low cost of this fertilizer. Also, urea is easy to use and store. Despite the importance of nitrogen for crop production, the use of this nutrient is associated with negative environmental impacts. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is very complex and when nitrogen fertilizer is applied to the soil, different transformations can occur and a portion of this nitrogen can be lost. Uh, in my presentation today, I will be only talking about the main pathways of nitrogen losses, but there are many other aspects of the nitrogen cycle that I will not have time to co cover, but they are also important. Anyway, one of the ways that nitrogen can be lost is through volatilization, as you can see here in this illustration. Uh, this happens when sources of fertilizer like urea are applied to the soil and not incorporated. Urea is hydrolyzed by the enzyme urease to ammonium, which can be converted to ammonia at the soil surface when soil conditions are favorable. While ammonium is a form available for plant uh, uptake. Ammonia is not and can be easily lost to the atmosphere as a gas. And why is ammonia volatilization important? Well, uh, agriculture activities are the major source of ammonia volatilization, accounting for 60, 60 to 85 percent of the total nitrogen, total ammonia gas emissions. And when we lose uh, nitrogen, this nitrogen is no longer available for crop uptake. Uh, and also in addition to that, ammonia can cause human health problems such as re respiratory disease and also negative impacts to the environment such as nutrient imbalances and eutrophication, for example. Another way that nitrogen can be lost is through leaching. Uh, as I mentioned before, when urea is applied to the soil, it is quickly transformed into ammonium, which may also be quickly transformed to nitrate. Nitrate is another form of nitrogen available for plant uptake, but it's also highly mobile and subject to leaching if precipitation exceeds the capacity of the soil to store water. Uh, again, why is nitrate leaching important? In this figure here, uh, we are looking at the map of the United States and the pink color here represents the upper uh, Mississippi River Basin. Uh, nitrate leaching from agriculture uh, in, the Midwest, in the Midwest can reach the Mississippi River and end up in the Gulf of Mexico. That's located right here. Excess of nitrate in the water can accelerate algae blooms leading, leading to hypoxia zones and negatively impacting marine life. One of the largest uh, hypoxia zones in the US is located in the Gulf of Mexico because of all this nitrate leaching coming from the, me from the Midwest. Excess uh, nitrate uh, leaching can also contaminate drinking water. Uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency standard for nitrate in drinking water is 10 milligrams per liter and levels at or below 10 milligrams per liter are safe for human consumption. Uh, moving on to keeping going to the nitrogen cycle, uh, the nitrate form can also be transformed to nitrous oxide when soils become saturated with water. 
uh, which is then lost to the atmosphere. Uh, this transformation is called denitrification. And why this nitrous oxide emission is important? Well, nitrous oxide is an important, a potent greenhouse gas. And in this figure here, we are looking at the sources of uh, greenhouse gas. And in 2019, nitrous oxide uh, represented approximately 7% of all the US greenhouse gas emissions and with agriculture being responsible for 75% of the total amount. Um, as you notice, uh, nitrogen can be lost in many different ways, and that can uh, be very impact very negatively the, um, the environment. Because of this, it's important to understand when nitrogen can be lost. Um, in this illustration, we are looking at the corn uh, plant nitrogen pattern, uh, which usually reaches peak around August, and then it starts to decrease. A traditional practice here in the Midwest is to apply the total amount of nitrogen fertilizer early in the season here, uh, either at pre-plant or in the previous fall. However, in Early in the season, corn plants don't uptake much nitrogen, as you can see here in this illustration. And that factor, in combination with greater precipitation and during this period, increase considerably the nitrogen loss potential, as it represented by the green line here. Uh, a few advanced nitrogen management practices have been suggested to reduce nitrogen losses to the environment. One of them is the use of split application, uh, which consists of the application of a portion of the nitrogen at the beginning of the season, before or at planting, and the remaining fertilizer applied later in the season when plants are taking up more nitrogen. In theory, uh, this practice would reduce the amount of nitrogen available to be lost during the time when uh, losses are more likely to occur, which is during the spring as shown in the previous slide. Enhanced uh, efficiency nitrogen fertilizer is another nitrogen management that's suggested to reduce nitrogen losses to the environment and increase nutrient availability to crops. Uh, in this study, we used two different types of enhanced efficiency fertilizers. One of them is a polymer coated urea called ESN. Well, this source of fertilizer has a polymer coating around uh, the granule of urea, which protect the nitrogen from loss mechanisms. Uh, this ESN has a membrane uh, that allows water to diffuse in, dissolve the nitrogen granule, and then create a water and urea solution, solution that slowly released to the soil control by, by soil temperature. Uh, we also use urease inhibitor, uh, which blocks the activity of the enzyme urease, which is responsible for the transformation of urea into ammonia that can uh, avoid some of the losses like uh, through volatilization. In this video, you are looking at a ESN granule uh, where water already diffused in and dissolved the nitrogen which is slowly released over time controlled by soil temperature. I thought this was a nice video to show you, to show you how ESN, ESN works in the field. Um, moving on to the first study, um, the title of this first part of my overall project is Subsurface Nitrate Drainage, Corn Yield and Net Economic Return Outcomes from Nitrogen Application Timing and Source. Uh, the objectives of this study were to evaluate if the use of advanced management practices such as split application and the use of ESN would reduce nitrate leaching losses and improve corn yield and net economic return compared to traditional nitrogen management practices, which in this study we consider as the application of urea at pre-plant. Moving on to material methods. Uh, well, this study was conducted at the University of Minnesota Southwest Research and Outreach Center located in Lamberton, which is represented by the yellow uh, star here in the, this map illustration. 
when these plots were established in 1994 in a poorly drained clay soil, plastic film was installed into in the boundaries of each plot for isolation and to avoid the lateral flow. And a tile drainage system was also installed. Uh, tile lines are used to remove the excess of water as represented by the left half of this figure here, which allows plants to grow more easily. In our study, perforated tile lines with 10 centimeters in diameter were buried into the soil one meter deep, uh, as represented by this figure here on your right. Uh, Dr. Satish Gupta provided me some pictures of the site establishment. In this first picture here, you are looking at the plastic film used to isolate the plots. In here, uh, you are looking at the pipes that were connected to the tile lines to remove the water from the site to the covert where the water sampling measurement equipments were allocated. And this picture here, you can look, we have a better idea how the plastic film looked like around the, um, the plots. Um, well, this is a picture of uh, our site. Uh, this study uh, was conducted from 2014 to 2020. I only helped to collect data from 2018 to 2020, but I analyzed all the data collected uh, for this study. The project was in a continuous corn cropping system. We set up the experiment in a randomized complete block design with four blocks as represented in this picture here by the rectangles uh, and with four treatments. Uh, the treatments used in this study were divided in traditional and advanced management practices the, uh, the treatment that represented the traditional management practice is urea uh, applied at pre-plant at a rate of 202 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Uh, three treatments were used to evaluate the advanced management practices. One of them was the application of 202 kilograms of ESN at pre-plant. Uh, and the other two advanced treatments consisted of the application of either urea or ESN at a rate of 67 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare at pre-plant and the remaining 135 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare applied around V4 and V6 as agrotin, which is uh, urea with that urease inhibitor that I mentioned before. Uh, the nitrogen app rate applied in this study was choosing to represent typical nitrogen rate used by farmers in the region of the study and was within the maximum return uh, to nitrogen rates recommended by guidelines from the University of Minnesota. Uh, the fertilizer applied at pre-plant was broadcasted and incorporated using a field cultivator, as you can see here in this picture. And the fertilizer applied around V4 and V6 was only broadcasted. Um, in here, I'm going to start showing the drainage systems that we use to collect the water. Um, we use two different systems, uh, one from 2014 to 2017 and another one from 2018 to 2020. Uh, in 2014, the water sampling equipment were installed and calibrated and drainage water samples were not collected that year. And from 2015 to 2017, water samples were collected using a tipping bucket system that's represented here in this figure here. Uh, the tipping bucket had a capacity of 410 mLs and composite composite water samples uh, were obtained by taking three mLs of water every other uh, bucket tip through a tube connected to an East Coast sampler, as the one shown in this picture here, which stored the water samples. Um, a new drainage water collection system was installed in 2018, as I previously mentioned, 
And in here, in this first picture, you are looking at the system that consisted of a submersile pump per plot that was connected to a hobo data logger to record timestamp for the flow, like this one here that I'm showing the picture in the middle. And water samples then were collected weekly or more frequently after raining events, as it's shown here in this picture on your right. Um, then the water samples, they, are, they were composite water samples. Uh, these samples were analyzed for nitrate, ammonium, and phosphorus. However, only nitrate is presented today here. Along with uh, water, we collected plant tissue and also soil samples. Uh, the plant tissue was collected at development stages V6, V10, R1, and R6. And afterwards, harvest grain was uh, combined. Uh, these plants were dried until constant weight. They were ground and then they were sent to the lab to be analyzed for total nitrogen. Uh, soil samples were also collected, as I mentioned before, at different times during the season. Uh, soil samples were collected using a probe truck, as the one representing this picture here, uh, to collect samples from before planting and after har harvest. And samples were also collected at V6, V10, and R1, a probe soil sampler, like the one in this picture here. Uh, soil samples were dried until constant weight ground and then sent to the lab for nitrate and ammonium analysis. And total nitrogen was estimated by adding nitrate plus ammonia. Um, the final uh, measurement in this first chapter uh, was the net economic return uh, that uh, was calculated by uh, subtracting corn revenue by cost of fertilizer and cost of fertilizer application. The, uh, the values used for cost of fertilizer and application were based on local service suppliers prices at the time of the study. Uh, for the statistical analysis, we used uh, the R software. The analysis of variance were done using the LME4 package. Uh, normality and homogeneity tests were also conducted to check for assumptions. Uh, ear was considered as a random effect for this portion of the study, for the study and treatment as a fixed effect. Moving on to the results and discussion. Um, before I get started, I just want to emphasize that for water, I will be only presenting data from 2014, 2015 to 2020, because we did not collect water samples in 2014. However, for, uh, for agronomic aspects, I will be presenting data from 2014 to 2020. Uh, in this first graph here, You are looking at annual precipitation in millimeters in the y-axis across years and the numbers inside of the columns here in white represent the amount of precipitation that was above or below normal precipitation. As you can see, precipitation was above normal in five of the six years here. And the only year with annual precipitation below normal was 2020. In this second graph, you're looking at annual drainage in millimeters in the y-axis across years as well. And subsurface uh, drainage amounts were dictated by precipitation amounts, as you can kind of see here in this comparing the two graphs. Uh, more precipitation usually resulted in more drainage. For example, in 2018 and 2019, uh, subsurface drainage was greater as a result of greater uh, annual precipitation amounts in these years. In here, in this graph, we are looking at the six year mean annual drainage in millimeters in the x axis and the treatments in the 
x axis. Sorry, I think I said um, annual drainage in the x axis actually is in the y axis. Uh, the different letters in the top of each column uh, represent the statistical differences between the treatments. Uh, subsurface drainage was lower for the treatment ESN uh, compared to the urea and urea urea plus treatment. It is important to mention that amount of drainage can greatly influence nitrate loads. Uh, more drainage usually means that more nitrate will be lost through leaching. Uh, in this slide, I'm presenting the nitrate load data. Nitrate load is the result of subsurface drainage water in millimeters times the nitrate concentration in water samples. Here we have uh, the nitrate load in kilograms per hectare in the y-axis and the treatments in the x-axis. Uh, similar to subsurface drainage, nitrate load was lower for the ESN treatment compared to the other treatments. And one of the reasons for these differences uh, between treatments is due uh, to the amount of subsurface drainage water that was lower for the ESN treatment compared to the other treatments. For this reason, uh, nitrate loads results should be interpreted with caution. Uh, because as I mentioned, subsurface drainage probably influenced nitrate load results flow weighted nitrate concentrations should be used um, to evaluate nitrate leaching differences between treatments, which uh, is presented here in this, table, in this table, the flow weighted nitrate concentration uh, across the years. Flow weighted nitrate concentration is the result of the annual nitrate load in milligrams per hectare uh, divided by the drainage water in liters per hectare. In other, in other words, uh, this tells us how much of nitrate in milligrams was lost per liter of drainage water. Uh, even though there was a pattern for lower flow weighted nitrate concentration for treatment ESN, similarly to what we observed before with nitrate loads, uh, there were no statistical differences between treatments in any of the years and for the seven year mean as well. Another thing to point out here is that nitrate concentration uh, were above uh, the standard drinking water in 2016 and 2017. Um, and our results uh, are showing that when the right rate of nitrogen uh, is applied, the use of the advanced nitrogen management practices like split application and the use of ESN uh, don't really help to reduce nitrate leaching losses to the environment. Um, moving on to the agronomic results, uh, in this first graph here on your left, you are looking at the seven year mean corn grain yield in the Y axis and the different treatments in the X axis. And in the second graph here in your right, you're looking at the total nitrogen uptake in the Y axis. Uh, the advanced nitrogen management practice ESN urea plus uh, significantly increased corn yield, as you can see here, when you look at the different um, bar, uh, column bars here. Uh, and the ESN urea plus treatment also increased total nitrogen uptake by 18 kilograms per nitrogen per hectare compared to the traditional uh, management practice urea. A while split uh, applications did not help to reduce nitrogen losses, as I mentioned before and showed as well. This advanced nitrogen management practice increased grain yield, as you can see here and total nitrogen uptake compared to the uh, traditional management practice, which is the urea uh, applied at pre-plant. In this final graph here, you're looking at the net economic return in the y-axis and the different treatments in the x-axis. Although uh, not statistically different between treatments, um, following a similar pattern than corn yield 
and total nitrogen uptake, an economic return was numerically greater for the split treatment, ESN urea plus, which is this last column here in the graph, and compared to the other treatments. The urea, uh, ESN urea plus generated $63 greater net economic return than urea, $52 more than ESN, and $46 more than urea, urea plus. Uh, moving on to conclusions, uh, bringing back the questions from the objectives, we concluded um, that the use of advanced management practices did not help to reduce uh, nitrate losses when the right rate of nitrogen is applied. Uh, we also found that the use of defensive management practices, uh, such as uh, split application with ESN, increase corn yield and net, net, net economic return. Um, moving on to the second study, uh, the title of the second uh, part of my overall project is Nitrogen Application Timing and source affects nitrate leaching and nitrous oxide and ammonia emissions in continuous corn. Uh, the objectives of this study were to evaluate if the use of advanced management practices helped to reduce nitrous oxide and ammonia volatilization compared to the traditional management practice. And a second objective was to evaluate if nitrogen balance was a good indicator of treatment efficiency and if the nitrogen balance would be a good tool to help to reduce uh, and nitrogen losses to the environment. Uh, in this second study, I will present in data from additional measurements that were incorporated in, this, in the same study that I presented before. Besides water samples, in 2018, we started to collect nitrous oxide emissions. And in 2019, we started to collect ammonia volatilization samples. Uh, all these new samples were collected from the same plots on the same site with the same treatments. Um, ammonia volatilization, uh, as I mentioned, I start, we started collecting in 2019. Uh, and the foams that we used, uh, we used foams uh, treated with phosphoric acid uh, and glycerol uh, to, call, to trap the ammonia. Uh, two chambers were installed in each plot in the same day of pre plant fertilizer application and planting. Uh, one foam uh, was placed in uh, in the bottom of each plot to capture soil ammonia, and another one in the top of the chamber to capture ambient ammonia. Uh, the bottom foams uh, were collected and replaced two, four, seven, uh, 14, 21, and 28 days after uh, each fertilizer application. Uh, in 2018, uh, we started to collect nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, this measurement was done uh, using one study chamber per plot, which were installed in the field in the same day than the ammonia chambers. Uh, two to three samplings were done each week on the beginning of the season, and towards the end, we uh, moved to one sampling a week. In this picture, you are looking at um, the base and the lid of the chamber. After placing uh, the lid, we inserted a syringe into the chamber and this slow, slowly collected the gas sample, which was then transferred to gas vials as demonstrated by this picture here. Uh, this sampling was done at time zero 30, 60, and nine minutes after chamber lead placement. Um, area scaled 
nitrous oxide emissions were calculated using daily nitrous oxide fluxes uh, by trapezoidal integration. Uh, we also uh, calculate yield scale nitrous oxide emissions that was calculated by dividing area scaled nitrous oxide emissions by corn grain yield. Uh, indirect nitrous oxide emissions were also estimated by multiplying annual nitrate leaching uh, by 1.1% and ammonia gas emission by 1% as suggested by the report that listed below. Um, for nitrogen balance, uh, we calculate nitrogen balance using the equation that I'm showing here. Um, for nitrogen inputs, we included fertilizer and nitrogen atmospheric deposition. Uh, the atmospheric nitrogen deposition was provided by Dr. Paolo Plagliari. Uh, and the nitrogen outputs included all the nitrogen losses, nitrate, nitrous oxide, ammonia losses, and also total nitrogen uptake, which is the sum of a uh, whole plant nitrogen at R6 and grain e nitrogen at, from post harvest. Change in soil nitrogen were the result of the total soil nitrogen from post harvest minus total soil nitrogen from before planting. For statistical analysis, we use the R software and the analysis of variance were done using the LME4 package. Tests were done to check for normality and homogeneity and treatments were considered as a fixed effects and the interaction between ear in treatment, when the interaction between ear in treatment um, was not significant, significant, separate analysis were performed uh, using ear as um, for the individual ears and also for the combined ears. Moving to results and discussion. Here we are looking at ammonia volatilization in 2019. In this column graph, we have the uh, cumulative ammonia uh, gas loss in kilograms per hectare in the y-axis. And in the x-axis, we have three different uh, measurements after pre-plant fertilization, after split fertilization, and both combine as total ammonia losses. Um, treatments are represented by the different columns here. In 2019, ammonia loss after pre-plant fertilizer here was 8% greater for urea compared to the average of the other three treatments. Uh, after split fertilization, cumulative ammonia losses were on average 9-8% greater for the split treatments compared to the pre-plant treatments here. And total ammonia losses were on average 77% greater for the split treatments compared to the pre-plant treatments. Uh, in 2020, cumulative ammonia losses after pre-plant fertilizer uh, application was 90% 90, 90 greater for the urea compared to the average of the other three treatments. After split fertilization, cumulative ammonia losses were on average 91% greater for the split treatments compared to the pre-plant treatments. And for the total ammonia losses were on average 84% greater for the treatments urea here. ESN urea plus and urea urea plus compared to the ESN treatment. Uh, ammonia losses after split fertilization were greater in 2018, yes, as you can see, compared to 2020. And one of the reasons for that is probably because of the low precipitation amounts in, 20, in 2019, which was probably sufficient, just sufficient to solubilize the fertilizer, but not incorporated the fertilizer into the soil. Uh, unlike 2020, uh, where a 20 millimeter precipitation event was probably enough uh, to reduce ammonia losses due to fertilizer incorporation. 
In this graph, I combined the data for the two years, and we found that after uh, pre-plant fertilization, the urea treatment increased ammonia losses by 72% compared to the ESN treatment. It is important to note here that the same fertilizer rate was applied for the treatment urea and ESN, but losses were much greater for the urea uh, preplant treatment compared to the ESN. After a split application of fertilizer that's uh, represented here in the middle of this graph, uh, split treatments produce on average 96% greater ammonia loss compared to the preplant treatment here. Uh, and over the entire sampling period, average across years, uh, preplant ESN reduced ammonia losses by 9% compared to the ESN urea plus treatment, by 88% compared to the urea, urea plus treatment, and by 81% compared to the urea preplant treatment. Um, the figures presenting this slide are showing the interaction between year and treatment for area scale nitrous oxide emission and yield scale nitrous oxide emissions. In this figure, in the figure on your left, you are looking at area scale nitrous oxide emissions, and in the y axis, in the in the y axis, and the treatments in the x axis. Uh, the area. Uh, scale nitrous oxide emissions presented here are the sum of the direct uh, plus the indirect nitrous oxide emissions that were estimated as I previously shown. In the second graph here on your right, you're looking at yield scale nitrous oxide emission in the y-axis and treatment in the x-axis. Um, the significant year by treatment interaction for area is scaled nitrous oxide emission and yield scale nitrous oxide emission illustrates that nitrous oxide emissions were substantially impacted by the amount and distribution of precipitation um, in relation to when fertilizer was applied and not as much by the timing of fertilizer application. For example, in 2019, uh, which is represented by the red line here. Uh, we can see that was an extremely wet year, uh, by the way. We can see that compared to ESN that's located right here, uh, urea produced much uh, more uh, nitrous oxide emissions compared to the ESN. Here in the top is located urea and here we have the ESN treatment. And if we compare the two points here, we can see how um, urea produce much more uh, area scale nitrous oxide emission and use yield scale nitrous oxide emission compared to the pre-plant ESN in wet years, which were 2018 and 2019, which are represented by the red and black line. Uh, moving on towards the end of my presentation, uh, the nitrogen balance uh, we that we calculated, uh, the nitrogen inputs that we you we included were uh, fertilizer and um, atmospheric nitrogen deposition, and we consider that the same amount was applied in each plot, since the same rate was applied and the same atmospheric nitrogen deposition was added to each plot each year. Nitrogen outputs and changes in soil nitrogen were not uh, different between treatments uh, and nitrogen outputs uh, were mostly influenced by total nitrogen uptake, which greatly impacted the nitrogen results. Uh, the nitrogen balance uh, greatly, very greatly between years and treatments and was mostly influenced by total nitrogen uptake, as I mentioned before. Uh, because uh, total nitrogen uptake overshadowed differences from other parameters used in this calculation, we concluded that nitrogen balance was not a good indicator of treatment performance and the nitrogen impact in the environment. 
um, for the conclusions, uh, we found that the use of pre-plant ESN <clears throat> helped to reduce uh, nitrous oxide losses, especially in wet years after fertilizer application. Uh, however, in dry years, nitrous oxide losses were similar between treatments. Uh, we also found that use of pre-plant ESN reduced ammonia volatilization losses compared to the other treatments and excess of precipitation actually helped to reduce ammonia loss because the excess of uh, precipitation incorporated the nitrogen into the soil. And we also concluded that the nitrogen balance was not a good indicator of treatment performance and nitrogen impact on the environment. For the overall conclusions, um, our study found uh, that nitrogen losses are greatly influenced by weather conditions. Uh, usually when excess precipitation occurred, uh, nitrate and nitrous oxide losses increased. Uh, in contrast, uh, under the same conditions, ammonia loss decreased due to precipitation-induced fertilizer incorporation. Uh, overall, uh, the advanced management practice is split application ESN Urea Plus, uh, increased corn yield by 10%, uh, total nitrogen uptake by 18%, and net economic return by 5% compared to urea. However, uh, this advanced management practice did not help to reduce nitrogen losses. Uh, the traditional management practice, preplant urea, um, did not help to reduce nitrogen losses in any of the years and produce lower yield and net economic return compared to the other treatments. On the other hand, uh, the advanced management practice, preplant ESN, reduce nitrogen losses, especially in wet years, uh, and produce comparable net economic return to the preplant urea treatment and to the split and similar yields to the split treatments. And finally, uh, nitrogen balance was not a good indicator uh, to assess environmental quality performance of treatments. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Agriculture Fertilizer Research Education Council, Nutrient, the foundation of, uh, for agronomic research and the Fertilizer Institute, for providing funding uh, for this project. And I also would like to give a special thank you to all of the people that help in this project. Uh, from the top to the left, we have Nick, Thor, Jason, Emily, Mateos, um, Jason, Emily, Steve, actually, uh, Lee and Mateos. I also would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Fabian Fernandez. Uh, I like to say that Thank you for the opportunity and for teaching me so much during uh, my master's. And again, thank you all of these people that are presented in these pictures here. Uh, without them, uh, this project would not be possible. They helped me a lot. Um, I also would like to thank you all my lab mates and my fellow graduate students from the Department of Soil, Water and Climate. Uh, my friends that supported me and encouraged me through the finish line. And I also would like to uh, thank Dr. Yushin Miao and Dr. Karozin for giving me the opportunity to TA uh, during uh, their class. With that, I would like to say thank you and open to any questions.